So now let's discuss a few technologies that are capable of generating much longer sequencing reads compared to the Illumina technology. So short read sequencing is great in large part because it's cheap, fast, and high throughput, but it does have its limitations. And so first of all, detecting structural variation in a genome is pretty difficult with short read sequencing. And so I'll discuss exactly why this is in the next few slides. But basically, in short, when you have, say, for example, a reference genome, and you're sequencing a new genome, and you want to detect events like duplications or inversions, you typically need reads that span the boundaries of, for example, where the inversion happened in order to actually detect it. And so having reads that span these kind of boundaries is easier when you have longer reads. And that'll become more clear in the next few slides. And so for reasons including detection of things like structural variation, and also for, you know, due to problems of trying to sequence repetitive regions using short read sequencing, which we'll discuss in more detail in the next lecture, actually. Um, doing tasks like sequencing genomes de novo is really difficult with short read sequencing. And so long read uh, is a major, has a major advantage for that particular task. Another thing that I want to briefly mention is that is the issue of sequencing bias. And so when we talked about Illumina SBS technology in the previous uh, previous video segment, I mentioned that both bridge amplification and PCR uh, amplification introduce bias into the sequences that you generate. And so PCR can actually be used in long read protocols as well. But bridge amplification is a step that's specific to Illumina technology. And so by switching to, for example, long read sequencing, you can at least eliminate bridge amplification as a source of bias. So one of the main benefits of both PacBio and Nanopore um, over Illumina is that they give you much longer reads. Um, you can easily get, say, for example, like 10 KB reads uh, compared to Illumina's, you know, 150 base pair reads. And so this helps you out in a number of different scenarios. And so, for example, suppose that you're interested in studying um, structural variation in the human genome. And so, for example, if you're interested in sequencing uh, regions that uh, have segmental duplications, so segmental duplication is a, basically a duplication of a relatively large genomic region, say, like, at least a KB, 1 KB long. Part of the problem is if you have short reads, um, in order to distinguish the fact that your genome has, say, uh, two copies of a given, in this case, blue uh, genomic region, uh, you need to have reads that span both the duplicated sequence, so the, the blue one of the blue arrows, as well as the flanking sequence. And that flanking sequence has to be different across your two copies. And so with short reads, uh, typically that's that's basically impossible. And so when you do short read sequencing of duplicated regions, uh, oftentimes you'll end up with, with what's called a collapse in assembly. So instead of having, you know, instead of seeing two different copies of a given region, you'll end up seeing just one copy uh, in your final assembly because you didn't have enough reads that span both the duplicated region as well as the unique flanking uh, sequence of that region. And so obviously with long reads, if you have long reads, your chances of getting reads that span both the duplicated region and the uh, unique flanking sequence is, is much higher. And so you'll tend to get, you'll tend to be able to resolve these kind of duplications. And so similarly, if you're looking at <clears throat> events like inversions, um, to be able to, to detect an inversion in one individual's genome versus say a reference, you need to have reads that span uh, the region that's been inverted, as well as the flanking sequence. Um, and so, again, that's pretty hard with short read sequencing, and so you might not detect that inversion event, but you'll be more likely to detect it the, with longer reads. And so uh, longer reads have major applications in, for example, helping to assemble genomes. Another area where long reads help us uh, is basically in... Uh, doing what's called haplotype phasing. And so in short, we'll get to this, uh, we'll go into this in more detail in the genetics lectures. Uh, 
But basically, obviously, between, say, for example, different humans in the same population, uh, you oftentimes see, uh, you can see a lot of common variants or SNPs uh, that are different between pairs of individuals. And so one of the, um, you know, one of the goals of human genetics is to be able to accurately uh, sequence, you know, all of the humans on the planet. Uh, and so what that involves is not just determining for each particular SNP in the genome, what is each individual's genotype in that position, but another important goal is to be able to phase that, uh, do haplotype phasing. And so what that means is you want to be able to determine which variants sit on the same chromosome uh, within a given individual. And so haplotype uh, phasing is very hard with short read sequencing because if your reads are only a few hundred base pairs long, then the chances of uh, sequencing two different SNPs on the same read is is generally pretty unlikely. But if you have long read sequencing, then this becomes much easier, obviously. So this slide basically just shows you that when you have long read sequencing, then your reads will tend to capture multiple SNPs on the same read which then allows you to face the genome because you know which SNPs occurred on the same chromosome. So the first of the two technologies we'll talk about is pack biosequencing. So for pack biosequencing, um, your average read length is, you know, on the order of 10 to 15 KB long, although you can actually theoretically go up to about 100 KB, uh, which is obviously much longer than Illumina's 150 base pairs. Uh, in terms of accuracy, the accuracy is around, you know, it depends on what kind of sequence you're sequencing exactly, but your accuracy sits somewhere on the order of like 88% or more. Um, and this compares to Illumina, which is, you know, more than 95%. Um, and, uh, you know, the throughput obviously is is on average much less than, than Illumina. So similar to the Illumina sequencing protocol, in the PacBio library, uh, prep step. You're taking genomic DNA, you're fragmenting it into smaller fragments, and then you're adding some adapter sequences on the ends to help with sequencing. Uh, unlike Illumina, uh, the adapter sequences are actually hairpin loops. And so in what's called the smart belt template, uh, basically you're adding uh, hairpin loops to either end of a genomic fragment to form these smart belt templates. And so the interesting thing about the smart belt template is that they are they're essentially structurally uh, linear in that uh, it's mostly basically just a linear strand of double-stranded DNA uh, with some hairpin uh, loops on the ends. But it's topologically circular in the sense that if you treat it as a single-stranded piece of DNA, then it's basically a circular piece of DNA. Um, and so these hairpin adapters are somewhat special in the sense that they provide a common primer binding site for DNA polymerase. And so uh, in the actual PacBio smart cell that we'll discuss in the next line, you can attach the smart bell template to, uh, or you can bind it to primer specific to smart bell adapters, as well as DNA polymerase to facilitate sequencing. So in the PacBio smart cell, uh, a smart cell is basically made up of thousands of small little wells, where each well is like a little microscope with a light source at the bottom of the well. And so uh, within each well, you have the light source on the bottom, and you also have the smart belt template uh, for, with one uh, DNA template, as well as DNA polymerase fixed at the bottom. And so the idea is that once you add the primer uh, that gets annealed to the, uh, to the hairpin loop, uh, you start adding nucleotides that are, again, labeled with uh, different colored fluorophores. And as each base is being uh, incorporated uh, into the template, uh, you basically send a pulse of light and uh, a color is emitted depending on which base gets incorporated. And so uh, kind of similar to uh, the Illumina case, uh, you're basically observing sequences of colors, which you then kind of translate into, uh, into an actual DNA sequence using a base color. Um, and so some of the interesting aspects of the PacBio technology are that, uh, number one, there's, there's no, in some sense, theoretical limit to the length of the DNA fragment you can sequence, even though I think in practice you, you can't really go beyond 100 KB. Um, another interesting aspect is that uh, even though the error rate is higher than Illumina, um, the errors are more random. And so what that means is that um, uh, 
there's less bias in the sequencing, uh, in the sequences that you get. Um, so for some types of sequencing, uh, sequencing technologies, uh, GC rich sequences, for example, tend to get more errors in them. Whereas with PacBio, the errors are kind of more evenly distributed among the different types of DNA sequences that you can, that you can sequence. <laughs> Um, and so another interesting aspect of the PacBio system is that because the uh, smart belt templates are circular, what that means is that uh, each smart belt template can get sequenced multiple times in theory. And so here's basically a visualization showing you that um, after you know primer is annealed to the template and DNA polymerase extends that primer, um, by the time it goes all the way around the entire circular piece of DNA, uh, it can kick out the old template and just keep sequencing over and over and over again uh, the same template. Um, and so that provides benefits because um, if you have like a small DNA fragment, um, that allows you to sequence the same fragment multiple times over. And so then uh, you can correct for errors because if you sequence the same piece of fragment over and over and over again, then if the errors are really random, then um, you can just take the consensus sequence from the uh, fragments that you did sequence, and then you'll get a more accurate uh, consensus read from that. And so the final technology we'll talk about in this lecture uh, is basically nanopore sequencing. And so with nanopore sequencing, uh, your total, you know, your maximum read length is actually over like a megabase, which is an insanely long uh, insanely long read. Um, the accuracy is, is still relatively high. It's somewhere on the order of 70 to 90 percent, depending on what kind of sequence you're looking at. Um, and the throughput again is is relatively low compared to like um, uh, compared to Illumina, but still like you get these super long reads. So at the heart of nanopore sequencing are proteins called nanopores which are basically pore forming proteins that uh, are canonically used to transport molecules across, for example, cell membranes, uh, and also DNA helicases, which, as you know, can unwind uh, their enzymes that can unwind uh, double-stranded DNA. And so in the nanopore sequencing setup, there's basically a synthetic membrane with these nanopore helicase complexes that are embedded in the membrane. Uh, and you're basically passing an electric current through the membrane. And so, uh, while the current's being passed through the membrane, uh, double-stranded DNA uh, fragments are basically passed to the helicase. So the helicase unwinds the double-stranded DNA and passes one strand through the nanopore. And now, depending on which nucleotide in particular is kind of being fed through the nanopore at any given time, there's basically some kind of measurable disruption to the current uh, that's being passed through the membrane. And because each nucleotide uh, kind of yields a unique uh, disruption of the current, uh, you can essentially read off a DNA sequence by looking at the pattern of electrical disruption uh, in the membrane. And so here's a hypothetical example of uh, you know, a single-stranded piece of DNA being thread, fed through uh, nanopore protein. And so here the idea is that as you're feeding the sequence through the nanopore protein and measuring uh, electrical current through the membrane, um, as we feed the sequence through the uh, nanopore and we Get different bases passing by, you'll see different changes in uh, in current until um, finally you finish uh, feeding the strand through the nanopore, and you can use basically an equivalent of a base color to look at these patterns of electrical disruptions and basically call bases. And so the last point I'll make is that uh, nanopore sequencing, at least compared to Illumina, for example, is extremely portable. And so here's an example of uh, nanopore sequencing being used on the International Space Station.